Good morning. Let's continue on with King of Heaven. Let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here in us.
Good morning. Welcome here this morning on this beautiful summer day. It was, I don't know, 10.30 the other night, and one of my children says to me how light it was still out. It is, and they don't go to bed when it's still light out. So we have been having later bedtimes, which having older kids isn't the end of the world. And then I was reminded that in about five, six months, or even less, it's not going to be so light out and so beautiful out in the evening. So uh, I'm just going to enjoy the nice weather and enjoy um, being able to see a little bit later in the evening. Well, welcome here. As we enter into this morning and the Lord's Supper, I want to ask, where are you looking this morning? I love the first song that was sung this morning. We want to see you, using our eyes to see Jesus. We might be looking at a multitude of things coming into church this morning. Maybe you're still looking at the week that we just came out of, full and busy and never enough time to get things done. Maybe you're looking at the week to come. End of school, teacher's gifts, report cards, more work, long weekend plans, and special events like weddings and grads. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're looking down, overwhelmed, sad, stuck, not sure where to start, or going through something painful and difficult. Whichever one of these places you're at or you're looking at, there is a more important place to look, to take the focus off of us and put it on the person who matters. So we're going to start by looking back with gratitude to Jesus and his death at the cross. One God who sent one son to earth to take the punishment for our sins for all of eternity. Next, we're going to look around at the body of believers here this morning. Sharing the bread and the cup together is a sign of our unity in Christ. We are all very different people, I'm sure as you know, with different thoughts and opinions and different lives, and yet we are first and foremost, and most importantly, united by our belief in Jesus. We're also going to look up towards heaven, where the risen Jesus, who beat death, who is currently alive and well, is right now interceding and praying for us. And finally, we're going to look forward to the day when Jesus will return. We celebrate the Lord's Supper as we proclaim his death and anticipate his return. Jesus himself, when he led the disciples through the Last Supper, he ate it in anticipation of the future. So I invite you to be intentional where you are looking this morning. If you are someone who wants to proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus and keep your eyes focused on him, I invite you to join me in the Lord's Supper.
Let's pray. Jesus, this morning we are reminded to be careful where we look. We want to be people that see you. And as we take the Lord's Supper, Jesus, we want to be intentional to look back to your death, to look around to this body of believers, to look up to you in heaven, and to look forward to your return. May our gaze be so fixated on you that no matter where we look, we see you. And we seek to honor you in all that we do and say and think. Thank you for this gift of your body and your blood. In your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite Dave up to MC the rest of the service. Well, good morning, everybody. I was a little worried we were going to have a pretty empty house this morning, but people came in after uh, I looked behind me like, oh man, the place is almost full again. That's great. Welcome back after the uh, Father's Day weekend. I hope you had a great Father's Day weekend last weekend and uh, now we have some uh, announcements I want to make if anybody has any announcements you can come to the front here and uh, we'll have you uh, make your announcements the uh, joint services there's two joint services with the Bible Church this summer Bible Church will join us here uh, next Sunday the 2nd of July and we will join the Bible Church August 6 10 40 a.m. so there's it's kind of nice to have a communal service uh, together with uh, the other church. Uh, I kind of, I, I enjoy that. There's people in the community that I don't see that much and then you get to meet them and it's good, good to be able to mingle that way. Children's Church is still going on for the last Sunday of June, so make sure uh, you have them out here for that. No Sunday school till fall now. But pretty much most of our programming is, takes the summer hiatus. Most people are, kid, once your kids are out of school, it seems like we pretty much have uh, you know, a lot of people are going to be missing in a way, uh, and ourselves included. So uh, Redberry, again, remember to hold them in our prayers and, and for the summer, their staff uh, needs that they have out there. And uh, so, like I said, if you, if you uh, know somebody, uh, if you want to like, sort of lean into them uh, about uh, that type of support. Uh, and uh, I think that you can read these announcements in your uh, email that you receive that's where I'm taking these off of so if you're not on the email uh, for the church uh, talk to Connie she can get you uh, onto the uh, email uh, we have uh, looks like Abe has an announcement here so Good morning yeah I'll just expand on what uh, what Dave was sharing and uh, I, uh, I didn't get the number one board member shirt but I, <laughs> I find I got a board member shirt and uh, we uh, uh, intentionally, um, throughout the summer, when board members are at camp and stuff, we want to be uh, recognizable to staff, visitors, campers, and, and stuff. And so um, we've really thrown ourselves out there and uh, and stuff. But yeah, um, there's still um, there's still space in camps. There's still some space for, for volunteers and stuff. And um, one notable area um, that we're looking for is. Uh, um, medic or nurse staff help. Um, we've hired a young person um, for summer, but we're uh, we're looking to see if there be any nurses, um, people that would uh, be able to come alongside, um, potentially, um, but kind of on a. If you can only come for like a week, um, that's okay because we have someone there that's constant, consistent. But someone more senior to come alongside this person to. Um, help guy or just uh, give assistance and, and stuff with uh, potentially some of the more serious or different various things uh, that happen at camp and uh, kind of see it as a, as a cool mentoring um, relationship or possibility and, and stuff and so kind of excited about how this looks uh, and stuff and so yeah if, you, uh, if anyone is able to help in any of those ways just uh, contact camp um, 
If you're not sure who to contact, you can just call the office number and we've got a whole new phone system. I haven't even tried it yet. I just call the people direct, but we've got a new phone system that it's supposed to direct you to who you're looking for. Uh, there's directions. I think there's hours and stuff. So um, yeah, I should actually phone it and see what's all in there um, and, and stuff. But um, yeah, and, and with that new program, it even saved us money. So it's actually pretty cool <laughs> and, and stuff. But uh, yeah, and then um, staff training starts next weekend. Man, did that come fast? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh man. So we, uh, next Sunday, we're actually, we're having a board meeting at camp uh, to gather with, uh, with the staff and to be able to uh, share a meal and uh, do a prayer time and stuff and just uh, really encourage them as, uh, as in their training. And then right after that, uh, camp starts in, yeah, like a week's time. So it's, uh, Pretty exciting, pretty crazy, but pretty cool how God is working in all of it and just really exciting to um, to see the staff and how he's working in them and just the, the many details that have come together in really quite a short time. Um, so just really uh, grateful for that. So yeah, thanks again. You don't know how long he's been asking for a board member shirt. <laughs> And I had not seen him yet this morning, so to see that Redberry board member, I mean, that is, uh, that's, that looks good. I like it. Uh, I have a completely different announcement this morning, uh, and this is coming a bit late, but uh, we want to announce that we are doing a mini, it's a summer camp and we're calling it Midweek Mini Clubs. Uh, we have, Melissa and I met and decided to make a switch from Family Adventure Week to these mini clubs. She's had a lot of success with having uh, all kinds of families from the community come into her mini club, uh, kids club, during the, the fall to spring season. Uh, and so we wanted to try this out for summer. So this is running July 11th to 13th, so it's a three-day mini camp. We will have grades one to three, a program for them in the morning from 9.30 to 12, and then in the afternoon from 1.30 to 4.30, for, it will be open for grades four to six. And so for the older grades, you can choose your camp. There's an art club camp, a science club camp, and a cooking club camp. Um, for the grade ones to three, they will get a variety of all kinds of camps when they come in. It's only $20 to send your kids for those three days. Uh, so if you're looking for something that's local, something in town, invite a friend, uh, come on out. I will be there. Uh, we are looking forward to a good time. We're also looking for some leaders and volunteers to help lead some of the small groups. So kind of like we did in VBS, uh, we had some leaders overseeing the groups as they went to their stations. If you are available, please let me know. We'd love to find some leaders. Um, and we're also looking for one more leader to lead a station. Uh, however, everything is planned and all materials will be provided. So you just get to step into that role and have fun with the kids. So if you're around that week, July 11th, 11th to 13th, come talk to me. I will put this poster up on the bulletin board afterwards so you can take a look and sign your kids up. Okay, anybody else have any announcements they need to bring forward this morning? If not, who is doing our reading today? Oh, you are. <laughs> yes, uh, maybe I should have just stayed up here. Um, I am doing scripture reading this morning, and I thought it would be really fun to have an opportunity to share some scripture that has been meaningful to me. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed hearing uh, everyone else share those scriptures in their lives that God has used over the years, or, or maybe it was something that God has been teaching you recently. And so as I was thinking about what I could share this morning, um, God reminded me of a scripture in Jeremiah that he used in my life as part of my call into ministry. And uh, the funny thing is, is this came o over eight years ago, probably about 10, nine to 10 years. It was when we were still living in Langham, so that's how I know it's over eight years ago. And uh, I remember wrestling with like, what is my future going to look like? And what direction do I head? I mean, at that point, I had three small children who were very much the focus of my time and my energy. But I was starting to feel like maybe there was something else. Um, 
And so I'm gonna read this, and as I read this, there may be some of you here who have already been called into ministry and can relate. And there may be some of you who God may be calling into ministry yet in your life. And for the rest of us, uh, even if we're not called into ministry, our lives are a ministry to those around us, in our families and in our communities. So in the beginning of Jeremiah 1, verse 4, it says, and this is familiar, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I, I didn't, I'm not calling myself a prophet. I didn't think God said that. But this next part applied. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. And then a little farther on it says this, Get yourself ready, stand up, and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified of them, or I will terrify you before them. It's a bit of a threat there. <laughs> Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. I think wherever we're at in life, we can remember that. For I am with you and will rescue you. Thanks, Tamara. Those are encouraging words. Um, for your scripture this morning. I wanted to just, I got an email this last, uh, about two weeks ago, and it's from Eliazar and Shayla, who, this is at the back of the church, they're with Matthew Training Center, and uh, last week when Damaris was sharing before communion, there was just lots of things that re resonated at the beginning of this letter with what she had said, and I thought, I should share it. It's just going to take me a minute or two for the email that they wrote. Um, they're at Matthew Training Center. We went there as a missions team about 10 years ago. We'd like to do that again and get to know these two couples. So hopefully sometime in the next couple of years, we could come up with another team and go down and get to know these couples and get into their world. But anyways, Eliazar wrote this. How easy it is to fall asleep. And his, his Gmail is called the joy of the Lord. How easy it is to fall asleep. How easy it is to hide when what God has given us. How easy it is to not be alert. Because then we can pretend not to notice. Because then we do not have to carry the burdens of others. Because then we do not have to get our hands dirty. Because then we can look the other way as if nothing happened. As if we do not notice. So we can avoid the sorrow, pain, frustration, discouragement of what it means to be really involved, to really be engaged. This was a thought I had a few weeks ago as I was hearing lots of people from different ministries we are serving struggling in their lives, hearing about marriages thinking to separate or people getting robbed and beating pretty bad, hearing of people struggling with anxiety and depression, hearing a church member acknowledge a problem with alcohol, hearing of people struggle with living a life of integrity because between what they say and what they actually do. Hearing of people wanting to give up some of the processes that God wants for their lives, etc., etc., etc. While the more we work with people in ministry, the more we realize that it is not always easy. That sometimes it's hard, frustrating, disappointing, and sometimes really, really sad. But in the midst of that, God keeps calling us to be alert, to be awake, to be engaged, to be there to care, to not fall for the temptation of indifference. 
There is a fine line between wanting to carry all those burdens with our strength, which is not enough, or simply look at the other way or fall to indifference. But what I felt God telling me that day was to do neither, but to be there to care, love, and serve, and to let him carry all the burdens because he has already paid for all of them. It is not easy, but we are trying to learn day by day. And it continues on, but it's just so powerful, his letter. And uh, even though he's very encouraged with it all, he just is really uh, struggling with what's going on too. This past month, it has been a roller coaster of emotions, but celebration, joy, and thankfulness. They also work in a little church, and 10 people were just baptized. And so uh, they just had an amazing day of baptizing with these people, and they're asking for prayer for them that they would continue to grow in faith and love. So at the beginning of it was this, the joy of the Lord. And I just thought of my life and the joy of the Lord. And so I went and I found it in Nehemiah 8 and to 10 and 8, verse 10. And, and it talked of the story of the Israelites and, and how they spent 40 years, and yet God never forsake them. And I thought sometimes... I'm, I'm almost 62, and some days I think I've had 40 years of trying to figure it out. I haven't been in the desert, but um, I've been in some kind of desert sometimes. But anyways, the, voice that, the verse that really thought out when I found this, the joy of the Lord, was just later on in that chapter, and I was just going to read it. So Nehemiah, even, even after everything they did, says but you are God ready to pardon gracious and merciful slow to anger abundant in kindness and did not forsake them so we serve an awesome God and so I hope we have joy the joy of the Lord is our strength for all our circumstances he doesn't take it away he just walks us with it and he's waiting for us to give it to him over and over so would you like to stand up and I love the picture look at that urn that Connie put up there <laughs> join with us please all these pieces broken and scattered in mercy God
right, so this morning we had the awesome experience to share bread and wine. And we share in the uh, salvation that we have through Jesus' death and resurrection. And that's such a great thing that we get to do this every week. I came from...
prison. And I am so excited to hear what you learned about this morning. So why don't we pray, and then you can go downstairs for Children's Church. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes, and we'll pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for being such a big God that we can trust you with everything going on in our lives. You are so good to us, and you have good plans for our life. And uh, even when we can't always see you, we can trust you, and we can believe in you, and that is faith. So I pray for all the children that as they go downstairs and learn about you, that you help grow them in their faith just a little bit more today. We love you, Jesus, so incredibly much. In your name we pray, amen. You are dismissed. Okay, aren't these guys just precious? <laughs> oh my goodness. I love that. Uh, it is my pleasure this morning to uh, welcome Cam back up to speak and give us this message. Uh, this is part two. Uh, if you were here two weeks ago, you would have heard part one. Thank you, Cam. Well, good morning once again. Um, two weeks ago, was up here and uh, shared a little bit with you from uh, Second Chronicles. We're going to kind of get back into that a little bit this morning. Um, I'm going to open with a word of prayer and then uh, get into what God's put on my heart. Lord, I thank you so much for this amazing day. I thank you for those precious little ones in the front that bring joy and smile to each of us as we watch them encourage each other walking by us, heading down to Sunday school. Pray your blessing on their time down there. And Lord, as we're up here um, looking to you for guidance, for encouragement, uh, for, for just the many things that, that you can impart to each one of us individually today, Father, thank you for the relationship that you have with each one of us as individuals and that, uh, that uh, you are a God of individual relationships. I thank you for the, the heart that you have for us. And as Dave reminded us, that you're, you're for us, not against us in all that we do. Help us to, uh, to see you and your will for us today. And I pray particularly that your words would flow through me today. Um, and just give me, give me some wisdom uh, as, as I unpack a message that you placed on my heart some time ago. We love you, Lord, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, uh, Lori, Lori isn't here this morning. We've got a, a dog at home that I don't think is doing all that great today. He's... He, um, so we're, we're kind of in the same, same boat. Uh, he's, he's getting towards the end. Hopefully we'll have him for a while yet. But I can appreciate how important these creatures are that God puts in our lives. Um, and, and I appreciate um, being able to pray for your family in that regard. So um, I was looking uh, a couple of weeks ago. We're looking at Second Chronicles. And there's actually, uh, it's six chapters of Second Chronicles, so we aren't going to have time to read them in church here. I'm not sure if any of you had a chance to look at any of these things, but we're looking at Second Chronicles chapters 14 through chapter 20. And this is primarily the story of a couple of guys, father and son, a father named a, uh, uh, sorry, Asa and uh, a son named Jehoshaphat. And last week we looked at Asa uh, just a, a quick little recap of some of the things he did. He started off really well. You know, in the, in the Bible, they describe through Chronicles and Kings, they describe kings as good kings or wicked kings. And uh, I think Israel had pretty much a whole straight run of wicked kings, but Judah had a lot of good kings and intermixed with some, some wicked ones. Um, I think when uh, this morning when uh, Damaris shared with the book of Jeremiah, um, Jeremiah was called to fight against the kings of Judah. And this would have been a little later on when, the, when Judah had uh, some wicked kings. So I think that would have taken place after the stories that I'm talking about here. I love the Old Testament. I love reading through it. Um, when I, 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 I've shared, I think, before, I think I've been about nine times reading through the Bible. So this, this section in Second Chronicles, I'd read it eight times before. And uh, for some reason, God placed some, 
some information on my heart. There's some stuff that jumped off the pages at me for me this time that hadn't the previous eight times reading it. I'm quite sure that I would have had to go through it those previous eight times to get to the point where I am here now. I love reading the Bible. I, love, I look forward to it. And I would encourage you to, to, if you're not in the habit of reading the Bible daily, I'd encourage you to do it. It's a, it's a very fulfilling thing to do. So in, in 2 Chronicles uh, 14, 15, 16 is a talking of Asa. He started off really well. He was faced with a challenge. He, he uh, called out to the Lord. The Lord saved him. Um, then he had a long period of peace, I think about 23 years, where I think he got a little complacent and uh, full of himself. At least that's what his actions would appear here. And then when he was faced with another challenge, instead of going to God, he went into the temple, took all the gold and silver out of the temple, offered, uh, made an offer to, uh, to uh, have an alliance with an enemy, a former enemy to break, because uh, he was being attacked by the king of Israel, and to break his, uh, his the, for the other enemy, to break his treaty with the king of Israel so that Asa could save his, his people. And the, the strategy worked, but then when he came back from all of the madness, um, Hanani, the seer, came to talk to him and said, what you have done is wicked. You, did, you know, before you called out to the Lord, and didn't he save you? Why did you go to the temple and take the gold, and why did you go to your enemy to try to form an alliance with him? Because of this, um, you're going to be at war for the rest of your life. And for the last five, six years of his life, he was at war. He had two years with a horrible foot disease. He finally died in agony. But he was still remembered as a good king overall. Um, even though he didn't finish very well, he, he made a big difference in Judah as a, as a king. Then his son, Jehoshaphat, took over. Now, at the end of Asa's time, it says uh, they buried him in a tomb that he had cut himself in the city of David. They laid him on a bier covered with spices and various blended perfumes, and they made a huge fire in his honor. So the people still honored him. It was, but he didn't finish very well. So then Jehoshaphat took over. I can't imagine, like you're watching your dad do all this stuff, and as a godly person, Jehoshaphat, it's hard to imagine what, what life would have been like with him uh, towards the end of his life's, dad's life. But I think in, according to this, he resolved to start well, and to carry on, and to carry on the, the good legacy of his father. Last week we celebrated Father's Day, and it, it became quite clear to me as, as kind of my messages bookend Father's Day uh, either side, that there's a lot of, as we as men, as fathers, can learn from this story in Second Chronicles. And, you know, prior to Asa, Asa's dad was described as a good king, a man after, like, not described specifically a man after God's own heart, but a, as a good king. Uh, he had his issues as well, but he was described as a good king. Uh, Jehoshaphat started off as a, as a good king as well, and I think he lived a, a more exemplary life than, he, than his dad did. So he used his dad as, a, as a, um, a good role model. And I think as fathers and grandfathers, a lot of us would love to model that to our kids and our grandkids. I know Dave talking about your little two-year-old grandson. Uh, you want him to be um, a man of God. That's above all else. You want to love him. But even if he makes shy with you for the rest of his life, as long as he's a man of God, right? Um, so Jehoshaphat would have watched his dad and would have learned from that. And it's quite apparent that he did. So at the beginning of chapter 17 in Second Chronicles, Jehoshaphat uh, says um, he strengthened himself against Israel, who was Israel had a wicked king named Ahab at that time. Uh, I think a lot of you are familiar with that name, Ahab. He was a notoriously wicked king in Israel. And so that was about the time of Jehoshaphat. And so he stationed troops in fortified cities, and he put garrisons in Judah, and he, he strengthened things so that Israel would not come against him, which, which Israel was in the habit of doing. Uh, particularly, Israel was a little ticked off with Judah because of what uh, Asa had done in getting their enemy to leave them and then uh, undermining Israel. So Ahab wouldn't have been real happy at, at that time with Israel. So, but it says here, he walked in the ways of his father David, that his father David had followed. He did not consult the Baals, but he sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. The Lord established his kingdom under his control and all Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat. This is really interesting too, um, so that he had great wealth. 
His heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. So it describes him as his heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. And I think, again, as men, uh, and certainly as women, as followers of Christ, it's about your heart. Like we were talking this morning, what are you looking at? What are you seeing? That's very, very important. But where is your heart? Because nobody can see where your heart is. You can have the best actions in the world and do all kinds of things that make you look really, really wonderful, but your heart can still be desperately wicked, fighting and rebelling against God. That's a possibility. Um, Good works are sometimes done as a facade to achieve a greater end in the world that we live in right now. So where is a person's heart? And that's, that's the key here. His heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. And uh, what I found also interesting here later on, it talks about, um, you know, he, he, he sent uh, officials all through the land of Judah to teach the word of God. They took with them the book of the law and, uh, of the Lord, and they went around the towns of Judah and taught all the people. So he was very deliberate in spreading the word of God, spreading the encouragement of the law. This is where we're getting down into verse uh, 16, 17 in that neighborhood, or sorry, 10 and 12 now. And then it says, The fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms and the land surrounding Judah, all of them, so that they did not make war with Jehoshaphat. And then this one really jumped off the page. Some Philistines brought Jehoshaphat gifts of silver as a tribute, and the Arabs brought him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 goats. Um, Philistines they're not really known in the Bible as bringing gifts to the Israelites. <laughs> they're sort of like the whole, through the whole Old Testament, the Philistines, that's, that's what uh, Goliath was. He was a Philistine. Like this whole thing, and then you see the Philistines brought his Jehoshaphat gifts. This man was highly, highly esteemed, even by his enemies, which is a remarkable thing. And just a quick little note, they brought him 7,700 rams and 7,700 goats. If you go back with his father, Asa, uh, when his father did some reforms in the land, um, he sacrificed 7,700 animals um, to, to the Lord um, when, when, when they were celebrating their, their kind of reunion with God. This number is fairly significant, but these are numbers that the Philistines brought. This isn't something that was initiated by Israel or Judah. So it's kind of neat, these little details in there, 7,700, it's a significant number. So Jehoshaphat became more and more powerful. He built forts and store cities, um, and uh, he kept experienced fighting men in Jerusalem. So he was, he was still prepared if anything went wrong, but um, he had, his, his dad had uh, 480,000 troops. Jehoshaphat had over a million. He had way more resources than his dad did um, for setting up defenses to try to deter the enemy from fighting. And uh, it looked like that worked for quite a while. And then it says in chapter 18, Jehoshaphat had great wealth and honor. And I think it went to his head a little bit here. And he allied himself with Ahab by marriage. Some years later, he went down to visit. So he wouldn't have married Ahab, of course. He married one of Ahab's daughters. And, um, but some years later, he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria. And Ahab slaughtered many sheep and cattle for him and the people. And, and uh, the people with him, sorry, Ahab slaughtered many sheep and cattle for him, and the people with him, and they urged him to attack Ramoth Gilead. This is the uh, Arameans. So they're urging him to attack, and Ahab thought, yep, I'm going to do it. So he asked Jehoshaphat, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat replied, I am as you are, and my people as your people. We'll join you in the war. Now, you've got to remember, Judah and Israel were still, they were all descendants of Israel, of Jacob. Um, so in that sense, they were one. But Israel had really set their camp where they were, they, they were doing a lot of evil things. Um, so Jehoshaphat said to the king, after saying, we are as one with you, or I will join you in the war. But then Jehoshaphat said to the king, first, let's seek the counsel of the Lord. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, 400 men, these are his prophets, and asked them, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? The prophets said, go, for God will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, is there a prophet of the Lord here that we can call on? 
And again, last week we, we celebrated the grads and, and there was uh, all of the wonderful young people graduating right now. And uh, one of the comments that was brought up was uh, the peer pressure that kids have to go through in school. This is something, and, and we go through in our workplaces, all of us have to deal with peer pressure. Uh, this is a thing. Well, in all the Bible, this is one of the strongest examples of peer pressure that I've seen. Um, and so here you got this one, so um, peer pressure for Jehoshaphat and for another guy who's going to come into this story right away. So Jehoshaphat said, is there a uh, prophet of the Lord that we can inquire on? The king of Israel answered immediately. Well, he says, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. There's one guy that we can talk to, but I hate him. <laughs> Because he never prophesies anything good about me. He always, it's always bad. His name is Micaiah, son of Imla. The king should not say that, Jehoshaphat replied. So he pushed back a little bit against the king of Israel. Imagine, I don't imagine the king of Israel was particularly used to being talked back to at all by anybody. But this is a fellow king, so he got away with it. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imla, at once. So here's where the peer pressure comes in. Dressed in royal robes, the king of Israel... Jehoshaphat and the king of Judah were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor by the entrance to the gate of Samaria with all the prophets prophesying before them, 400 prophets. Now Zedekiah, son of Keniah, had made some iron horns and he declared, this is what the Lord says, with these you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. When I looked at this, I thought, you know what, this guy needs props, seriously? <laughs> Like, isn't the word of the Lord enough? You need props. You've got to make these iron horns and, you know, give a little demonstration. Uh, that would be a warning flag right out of the gate for me. Anyway, all the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said. The Lord will give it into the king's hand. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, as one man, the other prophets are predicting success for the king. Let your words agree with theirs and speak favorably. Micaiah's response was, as surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what my God says. You want to talk about peer pressure. Okay, two kings, 400 prophets, you're standing there looking around going, ah, this may not go very well for me. So the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? And I got a feeling this is a real, with a sarcasm in his voice, Micaiah said, yeah, attack, be victorious, he answered, for they will be given into your hand. I can just kind of imagine this is because the king's response was, how many times do I have to make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So it wasn't, a, it wasn't an encouraging answer, even though the words sounded encouraging. Then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go back home in peace. So, in other words, you're done. You're done, Ahab. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, What? Didn't I tell you? He never promised to prophesy anything good about me, but only bad. So then Micaiah continued, as if the previous thing wasn't enough. The word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven sitting on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will lure Ahab, king of Israel, into attacking Ramoth Gilead? and going to his death there. One spirit suggested this, and another suggested that. Finally, a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will lure him. By what means, the Lord asked. Well, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. <laughs> Imagine saying that in front of all the prophets and the king. You're standing there, one guy. Um, so I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. You will succeed in luring him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So, and this is Micaiah's word. So now the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, the guy with the iron horns, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Which way did the spirit from the Lord go when he went from you, uh, from me to speak to you, he asked. Micaiah replied, you'll find out on the day when you go and hide in an inner room. The king of Israel, so now this is king of Israel's response, kind of interesting. Take Micaiah, send him back to Ammon, the ruler of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, this is what the king says. Put this fellow in prison, give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. Micaiah replied, 
If you ever do return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, mark my words, all you people. So I'm imagining Micaiah went off to jail and he was there. So uh, without going through reading all the details here, but Ahab decided to attack Ramoth Gilead. He dressed himself, he disguised himself so nobody would know he was the king. I think a lot of you are familiar with this story. Um, and uh, the enemy couldn't really find him. So one of their people, archers, just randomly went like this and fired an arrow into the air. And it just happened to hit the king between a couple of cracks in his armor and mortally wounded him. And the king got himself taken out at sunset. King Ahab died. So when Jehoshaphat, son of Judah, returned, this is chapter 19. Now, when he returned safely to his palace in Jerusalem, Jehu the seer, son of Hanani, went out to meet him and said to the king, now, Jehu the seer is a son of Hanani. Hanani the seer is the one who went to his dad, Ahab, and said, you screwed up big time. Like he really called him out. His dad's response at that time with Hanani was throw him in jail. Um, and then he brutalized his people. He, his dad made a horrible decision when he was confronted with his own failings. And this is something that as, as a dad, I don't want to be that guy. And I think a lot of the men in here, we don't want to be the guy when you're confronted with your failings. Somebody comes up and says, you messed up here. Instead of digging in and doubling down and saying, get out of my house. I don't ever want to see you again. I want to be the guy who says, you know what? You're right. I need to do better. And that's a posture that all of us as men have to. We, we fight against that all the time because we're always proud. That's, that's the way we are. So Jehoshaphat was placed with, faced with this thing. The very son of the man who really called his dad out in a, in a serious way came up to him and said, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. There is, however, some good in you, for you have rid the land of the Asherah poles, and you have set your heart on seeking God. So this wasn't a complete condemnation. He's saying, you're not without hope. But he said, you know, this doesn't go well for you. So then what did, what did Jehoshaphat do? He didn't throw Hanani, or, uh, Hanani's son in jail. He appointed judges, and he wanted to make sure that everything was done fairly. And if we read in chapter 19, a lot of the things Jehoshaphat did, and he's, he's at, telling these judges, judge carefully for the Lord is the Lord God. There's no injustice or partiality. Make sure that you judge. The Lord is with you. And then he set up um, uh, priests to settle disagreements among the people, and he, had, he told them the same thing, um, that you're serving God, you're serving faithfully, and there's, there's no selfishness in any of this stuff. So chapter 19 covers a lot of that. And then what I found, and this is kind of when we were doing our, our lead team meeting, is the stuff in chapter 20 was the one that really started um, kind of speaking to me. Uh, when we're talking about planning and, and direction that the, that the, the lead team is, is discerning for the church. Um, and when we got into chapter 20 here, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Meonites came to make war on Jehoshaphat. So three different groups came to make war on Jehoshaphat. And some men came, came and told Jehoshaphat, there's a vast army coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It's already at Hazan, Hazaz on Tamar. Um, alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. So that's what he did. Instead of like his dad in a similar situation at that stage of his life, his dad went into the temple, raided all the silver and gold, tried to make an alliance with an enemy, which, which worked uh, for, for the, the war side of things. But that's when God called him out. In this case, Jehoshaphat, first thing he did was he inquired of the Lord. And uh, he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. So he, he inquires the Lord, says to the people of Judah, we're fasting. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord under the leadership of this godly king. Uh, without that leadership, they would not have done this. Um, leadership is really, really important. And, and those of us who are in leader, leadership, I think, start to realize that more and more as time goes on, how important good leadership is. Um, I won't make any comments about our country um, right now. <laughs> Enough said, but leadership is crucial. And so the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. They came from every town in Judah to seek him. And then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the temple of the Lord in front of 
of the new courtyard, and he said, this is in front of all the people, there's a, a bit of a prayer here, and I'm actually going to read this because it's, uh, it's not super long, but it's there for a bit. O Lord, the God of our fathers, and imagine this, this king in front of all his people, faced with an insurmountable army, um, apparently insurmountable. O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people of Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have, <clears throat> sorry, they have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether by sword or judgment, plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now there are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance? O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Imagine again, a king, most powerful man in the land, standing saying, I got nothing. <laughs> He's standing there in front of all his people saying, I got nothing myself, but I know a guy. I know God. And this, this powerful prayer that he did, which remembers the history of the Israeli people, not just the Judah, Judah but all of Israel. And it's, it's an incredibly powerful and inspiring prayer. And this is one I've gone back to a few times when I'm faced with challenges, when I'm faced with something that, boy, this is going to be tough. Um, there's some challenges here. I go back and read this, this prayer and find it very, very encouraging. It's amazing. And then what happened after that? All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jeel, son of Mataniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, and he stood in the assembly. So Jehaziel stands before the assembly, and these are the words that he said. Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. And I, I note, he didn't have a pair of iron horns he was waving around to try to make his point. He was, he was just talking the word of the Lord. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. And this last sent next sentence is the one that really jumped out that I shared with our lead team. For the battle is not yours, but God's. And this is something I think we all need to remember when we're faced with a battle. As a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit indwelling us, whatever battle we're facing, whatever it is, the battle is not ours. We can't, we can't guarantee any outcome of anything that we do, ever. The battle is not ours, it's God's. And we, we hand it over to God, we allow God. That doesn't mean you, you, you don't have to do anything, but acknowledging that this is outside of my control. I can have some influence, I can have some input. Strong leadership is really, really important. Don't want to abdicate leadership because God's got this under control. He's calling us, some of us, to be leaders. He's calling others to be servants. He's, he's got each of us with our own role. But the battle is not yours, but God's. And then he says, tomorrow, march down against them. Again, he's not saying, you can just sit here. We'll take care of it. He says, tomorrow, march down against them. They'll be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you'll find them at the end of the gorge at the desert of, of Jeruel. You do not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will give you. O Judah and Israel, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. So once again, this is, to me, so encouraging, because we're not called to sit on our duffs and do nothing and say, God's got this. We're called to step into things as well. God's got a role for us in everything, but he ultimately is the one who's in control and who makes things happen. And they don't always happen the way we expect them to. In this case, I think they did. So Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshipped before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. So early the next morning... They left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith. Again, leadership, reminding them. Have faith. 
The Lord your God is with you and will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. Then he consulted the people. So after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. Again, for no other reason than to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. Not, it doesn't say here for what he's going to do or any of this other stuff. They're praising him because he is holy and there's a splendor in that. And again, uh, we, we so often go before God saying, God, I want this. Here's my list. And, and that's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, that's not what God is there for. He's not a cosmic wish giver. He's not a genie. He's, he's the God of creation. He's holy. And it's important for us to remember to praise him the way Jehoshaphat's people did, to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. So as they went out at the head of the army, they said something in this one. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. There's a wonderful song, and I, um, I know that we've, you know, uh, give thanks to the Lord our God and King, his love endures forever, for he is great, he is above all things, his love endures forever. This, this is kind of where it came from, except for when I look at the notes, it goes back into earlier in Second Chronicles with Ahab, saying the same thing after coming back to God. And then we go back and look a little later. Those words came from David himself. He wrote a song back in, um, oops, I've lost track of my notes here, in uh, yeah, 2 Kings, I believe, where David, um, David writes these, write, wrote those words himself and sang them. So this goes all the way back. This is when they brought the ark back to the, to the tabernacle is when those words were first penned. So they're being repeated by the people in Second Chronicles as they march out against this unbelievable foe that they appears to be no hope of winning. So they sang these words, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing in praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. The men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men from Mount Seir. So these three enemies started fighting amongst each other to destroy and annihilate them. After the, they, after the men from, destroyed the men from Mount Seir, they turned on each other and, to, and went to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to their place that overlooks the desert, and they looked towards the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder. They found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. It took them three days to take away the plunder, which was a thing that they did in those days. Um, but they actually didn't kill anybody. They, they just went in here and they, they took the plunder from this army that had tried invading them. So um, Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them victory over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem, and the first thing they did when they entered Jerusalem, they went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lutes and trumpets, which is kind of in contrast to what his dad did when he went into the temple at near the end of his life. He took all the gold and silver out to try to make a deal. These guys were bringing stuff back into the temple, the stuff that, they had, that God had um, restored for them, and this is all stuff that God had done. Then the fear of God came upon all the kingdoms and the countries when they learned how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel and the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace for his God had given him rest on every side. And then I think Jehoshaphat kind of had the same problem that his dad did. He had a long period of peace and harmony and um, it would appear that he, as happens with I think all men that I know, has a tendency to get a little full of himself. Things are really good, I'm great. I'm 10 feet tall and bulletproof, whatever the case may be. And so that, because his actions sort of, they slipped a little here, you know. Um, it says he reigned over Judah 35 years. When he, be, uh, he was 35 when he became king. He ruled for 25 years, so he was 60 years old when he died. He walked in the way of his father and did not stray from them. So, you know, the Bible speaks favorably of him. But at the end it says... Um, Later, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, made an alliance with Ahaziah, king of Israel. Ahaziah is the one who um, succeeded Ahab. And he was a wicked king, too. Um, who was guilty of wickedness? He agreed with him to construct a fleet of trading ships. And after these were built, um, this Eliezer, uh, who's a prophet, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have made an alliance with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. 
The ships were wrecked and were not able to set, set sail at all. Then Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers. He was buried with them. His son Jehoram succeeded him as king. And this is where things kind of get, you know, I, I always, I'm always a little puzzled when I, when I read through some of this stuff. You get Jehoshaphat, his dad, and his grandfather were all godly kings. They were wonderful, thing, wonderful kings. And then when you read about Jehoram, the wheels really fell off that family at that point in time. Like, this is, this is not just a little bit of a strength from the Lord. This is unbelievable stuff. And you kind of wonder, Jehoram was the oldest boy, and it says, uh, it names a bunch of uh, Jehoram's brothers. Um, Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azaruhu, Azarihu, sorry, Michael, and Shephatiah. All these were sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father had given them many gifts of silver and gold and articles of value, as well as fortified cities. These sound kind of little like spoiled guys, like spoiled boys um, as a family. They'd been given a lot. And this is the cycle that we have. And as a dad, I don't want to, like, I know Lori and I, are, we've been going through a process of trying to figure out succession and, and estates and, and things like that. And, you know, I don't want to be giving my kids and grandkids so much stuff that they'll never have to work. It makes them, it, it spoils them. And it, 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 I think it ruins kids when you give them too much stuff. And I think that that's, there's a cautionary tale in here with, with Jehoshaphat. It looks like he gave his kids so much. And then he appointed his son, or sorry, they, they, uh, his son was appointed king because he was a firstborn. His son Jehoram was. And it actually kind of goes to pains here. This is, um, he had given the kingdom to Jehoram because Jehoram was his firstborn son. And that was culture, but it kind of sounds like Jehoram wasn't necessarily the best choice. He was just the firstborn. But okay, because you're firstborn, this is what I'm obligated to do. So what does Jehoram do in 21? Now we're moving a little out of 20 here, but when Jehoram established himself as firmly over his father's kingdom, he put all his brothers to the sword along with some of the prophets, uh, the prophets of Israel. Like he killed his brothers and then things started going downhill from there. Um, that's not, not a real good legacy. That's not something that Jehoshaphat would have been would have been working towards. Um, I'm sure that if he had been aware of this something that was coming down the line, um, that enabling by just giving things to people all the time, spoiling them, can have that kind of a consequence. You end up with somebody who's, who's so full of themselves. Now, as a king, he has the, the legal authority to kill whoever he wants. Um, but, you know, so it's, it's something that, that kind of went downhill from there, and then we see generations of different things happening where they... they uh, things get kind of, things get kind of, uh, well, not kind of, they get horrible. And generationally speaking, there's a number of things that happen until uh, young Joash, who's mentioned earlier in, in some of the stuff that we had read, this little young Joash uh, gets hidden by um, um, an aunt, I believe, and he ends up becoming king at the age of seven or eight years old later on. He's a descendant of, uh, of Jehoshaphat. But there's some real troubling things that happen in the middle there. And a few things that, that just I really wanted to make sure that we're, you know, that we're part of what, I, what I'm talking about this morning is this whole idea that whatever you're facing, whatever you're facing, the battle is not yours. The battle is God's. And we can rest in that. It doesn't give us license to do nothing, but um, we need to seek God. And um, as, as men, again, kind of book, bookending Father's Day, both sides of this message. As men, uh, we need to be aware that we're in a battle and that we also need to have, I think the Bible will give us discernment and wisdom to, to figure out where we need to be going as men and leaders in our family. Like God is calling each one of us as men to be leaders in our family. I know that the, many of the problems that the world is facing right now are a direct result of men abdicating their leadership responsibility in society and in families. It's an absolute fact. Um, we don't want, none of us here want to be guys like that. We want to be engaging in our family, in our community, wherever God's calling you to serve or lead, um, be obedient to that. And that starts with, the Bible tells us in many places, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Both of those things are in the Bible. 
And uh, I want to encourage you, um, all of you, men and women and children, uh, youth, to, uh, to be deliberate in spending time every day in God's Word. This is the root of all wisdom. This is the source of all wisdom. And it's something that you can never go wrong by spending that time in God's Word. And if, if your experience is anything like mine, it was a bit of a uh, discipline at first. And after a relatively short period of time, it became exciting. I can't imagine not spending time in God's Word. And I love, I love going through some of these stories in the Old Testament because they're so rich and there's so much stuff in them. Um, I, I have to kind of almost chuckle to myself when I hear somebody say, oh, the, the Old Testament's irrelevant. It's just everything's about the New Testament and grace and so forth. And I'm going, no, you, you just don't get it. <laughs> this is one book, and there's so much richness in the Old Testament. Um, you know, start to unpack it. And uh, hopefully that'll make a difference in your family and your legacy so that if you were able to look back 100 years from now and see your children, grandchildren, that kind of stuff, that there's been some good decisions made because I know that's on the heart of all of us. That's what I wanted to share with you this morning. And uh, we're just going to close with a quick word of prayer. Lord, once again, uh, we, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving. Um, we want to give thanks to you because your love endures forever to, to sing for the splendor of your holiness. And Lord, help us to have that posture. Help us to remember who you are, what you've done. Lord, that you created all things, you sustain all things. There's not a single thing in all of creation that can exist without you, your sustaining it. And help us to remember that when we get full of ourselves, Father. Help us to be humble in your sight. Help us to love you and to show the world through meaningful action and through wisdom, decision, and leadership, if called for, servant, if that's what you're calling us to do. Help us, Lord, to serve, to lead, to, to do whatever you've called us to do throughout this coming week and these coming days. And give us, give us uh, the mind of Christ as we do that. We love you, Lord, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We like to stand as we sing this last song, Hope of the Nations.
1 Corinthians 16, verse 23 and 24. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen.